Throughout human history, there are those who rise among us, whom lead and inspire others to fight for their passions and ideals. Some are malicious, others altruistic, but few have such a controversial and disputed legacy as Joseph Braz Tito, the benevolent Caesar of the Balkans and president of Yugoslavia. At a time when choosing sides was not only expected, but necessary for survival, Joseph Braz Tito chose a third way for his country, his people, and other nations around the world. Some call him a butcher and a menace, while others call him the savior of the Slavic people. This is the man, the legend of Joseph Tito. Josef Broz was born in May 1892 in the Croatian village of Kumrovets on the border of Slovenia. His father was a Croat. His mother, Maria Jevornak, was of Slovene descent. At 16 years old, Josef left Kumrovets and traveled to find work in the industrial setting. Soon, however, he moved to Vienna, then the capital of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, where he first began to study Marx. Broz was drafted in the Austrian-Hungarian army at the beginning of the First World War. He fought on the Eastern Front in Poland and distinguished himself by becoming the youngest sergeant major in the Austrian-Hungarian army, and was nominated for Medal of Bravery before he was lanced by a Russian bayonet and captured. This landed Broz in a Russian prison during the October Revolutions. When he was released, Broz was further exposed to communism. Broz believed that these new economic and political ideals could revive and strengthen his home country. And in 1920, Broz traveled back to Kumrovec, now part of the larger Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Even here, the effects of the October Revolutions were felt. A year before Broz's return, the Yugoslav Communist Party was formed, or the CPY, and 59 communists had been elected into the Constituent Assembly, the Parliament of Yugoslavia. But in 1921, a series of assassination attempts by radical communists led to the outlaw of communism across the board. Despite his attempts to practice and preach the ideals of Marx in secrecy, Braz was brought to trial in 1928 for his illegal practices and sentenced to six years in prison. Upon his release, he headed to his hometown. After the trip, Braz described his visit to a contemporary. I thought of everything that I had seen and the poverty and backwardness that had weighed on us for centuries. And I thought, too, of the day when Kumrovets and thousands of other towns and villages like it all over Yugoslavia would rouse themselves from that backwardness. Rosny continued on to Vienna to speak with the Central Committee, the Yugoslavian Communist Party in exile. Braz filled the vacant position of Secretary General in the CPY. Joseph Braz then returned to Yugoslavia. As he did, though, the CPY experienced a great period of growth. When on April 6, 1941, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia was invaded on four fronts by Germany, Italy, Hungary, and Bulgaria. The nation capitulated two weeks after the war began, and Yugoslavia fell under the shadow of fascism. The official surrender of the Yugoslav government only marked the beginning of a long and bloody guerrilla war. Joseph Tito founded a military branch of the Communist Party and proceeded to wage war against the invaders and their collaborators. While Tito organized communist resistance to the invaders, a royalist faction named the Chetnik Movement also formed in opposition to the new rulers. Meanwhile, Tito and his partisans began a systematic war for liberation of their nation. Tito recruited many to his banner and liberated swaths of territory, particularly in rural regions of the nation. Partisan actions were met with horrific retaliations by the Germans and led to ethnic cleansing. All the while, Tito continued to call for unity between the Balkans and remained the leader of the resistance in Yugoslavia. As the war dragged on, more atrocities were committed on all sides, but Tito remained in defiance of the fascist governments and gained ground against the occupiers. And by the time the Soviet army reached Tito's lines, he had the ability to liberate the nation. In the late fall of 1944, Tito, with Soviet support, launched a nationwide offensive against the Germans, and Belgrade, the capital of Yugoslavia, was captured by the partisans. It is notable that Tito and his troops were the only ones to liberate their nations during World War II, independent of Allied support. Nazi forces driven out, Tito became the functional head of state. Elections were hosted in November of 1945 to determine the future of the Yugoslavian government. Tito enjoyed massive public support from the working class because he was a symbol for Balkan resistance. As a result, Tito won 80% of the vote. The Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia was declared. Following the establishment of the Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia, Tito began to rebuild his war-torn country. On the path to reform, Tito called for the abandonment of nationalistic tendencies based on ethnic and religious lines and began to focus instead on the advancement of the South Slavic people as a whole. 
While Tito made strides in tying together the fragmented cultures of Croat, Slaves, and Serbs, it should be noted that he left out the ethnic and religious minorities of Italians, Chetniks, Catholics, and Germans, many of whom were charged with collaborating in the war with the Axis powers. The Yugoslav government imposed harsh taxes on those who were suspected collaborators and even banned the Catholic Church for their involvement in the war crimes committed. Those who remained were subject to suppression and summary executions by members of the Yugoslav government for the first few years after the war. While Tito did not make any formal stance on the topic, many suspect his passiveness indicates his approval for such horrific acts. Directly after the war concluded in Yugoslavia, the USSR and Joseph Stalin began pressuring many of the newly liberated nations in Eastern Europe to become puppet states of the USSR. Tito began to distance himself from Stalinism in order to preserve his socialist ideals. However, Stalin did not take kindly to the blamed opposition to Soviet interests. While Stalin envisioned a friendly, market-controlled economy reliant upon the USSR, Tito wished to remain more moderate, with profit-sharing between the workers and the government. Tito's system would become a foundation for modern socialism and more liberal communism. However, it did not take long for Stalin and Tito to polarize, and multiple attempts were made on Tito's life. I will shake my little finger, and there will be no more Tito. Stop sending people to kill me. We've already captured five of them, one of them with a bomb and another with a rifle. If you don't stop sending killers, I'll send one to Moscow. And I won't have to send a second. After five years of tense relations, Tito and Stalin split, both politically and ideologically. In the following five years, Tito was kicked out of communist form. But Tito implemented new social reforms, including a continuation of his ambitious five years plan, which aimed to industrialize and electrify the small towns of Yugoslavia, like his home, Kubrovec. Tito slowly climbed to the top of the Yugoslavian political totem by reforming the government in Congress. By 1954, Tito was president in all forms but name. A year later, Tito gained the title as well. For a unified Yugoslavia, Tito's election was the beginning of an era of economic prosperity and political stability following the horrors of World War II. Although not popular among some of the more conservative Serbians in the party due to their feeling of entitlement to power as leaders of the Southern Slavs, Tito was widely regarded as a benevolent dictator. Receiving economic help from NATO and communist form following Stalin's death, Tito successfully charted a course between the two sides that benefited no state more than Yugoslavia. Following the successes of his economic reforms, Tito became a leader in the international community developing economies in the third world nations. To this extent, Tito offered his own financial aid, but would take another step forward in 1961 with the creation of the non-aligned movement between Egypt, Yugoslavia, Ghana, India, and Indonesia. This coalition pledged to stay neutral between the Warsaw Pact and the NATO treaty entities. Furthermore, the coalition focused more on the development of recently freed colonial nations and a dedication to preserving peace between the West and East. The non-aligned movement offered a third way for countries to politically stay neutral while receiving economic aid essential to the success of their emerging economies. For the next decade following the establishment of the non-aligned movement, Tito began to reform his single-party system to be more inclusive to all of Yugoslavia's different nationalities remaining, primarily Slav Slovenes and Croats, who usually received little voice in opposition to the Serbian domination of the party. Tito was also elected president for life in 1963. Furthermore, Tito also abolished, abolished all visa requirements for migrants and opened Yugoslavia's doors to foreigners. By 1971, with the last of his social and political reforms completed, Tito slowly receded from public life, while still remaining a public figure of Yugoslav unity. In 1980, Tito's health fell rapidly. Within the year, he was hospitalized due to circulation problems with his legs. Finally, the last straw came with the amputation of his left leg left him infected with gangrene. On May 14, 1980, Joseph Tito, the Balkan Caesar, finally passed away in his home country of Slovenia. Tito's legacy is incomplete without discussing the cataclysmic dissolution of Yugoslavia following Tito's death in 1990. Without a central figure ruling Yugoslavia, old ethnic, religious, and nationalistic tensions began to resurface. In 1991, Serbians, who felt entitled to rule, fought to keep the nation together under Serbian rule. While Croats and Bosniaks were not aligned with this plan, Serbians made up the political majority of Slavs and imposed their views through ruthless violence, internment, and ethnic cleansing. Their former Republic of Yugoslavia reached a boiling point as Slovenia and Croatia declared independence, followed by Macedonia and bosnia Herzegovina. Under Tito's rule, power was shared between the provinces, and a unified nation was not only possible, but pleasable. This was Tito's great feat. 
With the religious and political differences between Croats, Serbs, and Bosniaks, it took an incredible leader to unify the varying ethnicities. Only the political genius of Tito could accomplish such a task. We have split an ocean of blood for the brotherhood and unity of our peoples, and we shall not allow anyone to touch or destroy it from within. After his death, the region of Yugoslavia became volatile, and war and genocide rivaled only by crimes committed 50 years earlier at Auschwitz and Dachau were committed by Serbians in the name of preserving the Union. It took only one decade after Tito's death for the nation founded on Southern Slavic brotherhood and unity to fall into bloody fragments. Thank you.